All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tim Larkins. I manage the market intelligence team here at MX Group, and it's our pleasure to welcome you to our FY14 Cybersecurity Trends and Opportunities Briefing. Um, if you followed any of our briefings in the past, you know that we've tended to stick to one particular agency, um, but today actually marks the first time in four or five years where we decided to brief industry on a particular vertical. So uh, we hope that you walk away today with some better knowledge and understanding of the cybersecurity vertical within the federal government, more specifically, uh, more knowledge about uh, particular threats, policies, and key decision makers that are shaping the opportunities that software vendors can sell into the government uh, in the coming year. Now first, I want to talk uh, for just a moment about Imix Group. I do see a lot of familiar faces out here, so I know that Many of you do work with our company, but for those of you that aren't as familiar with Imix Group, um, Imix Group helps technology companies do business with the government. We were founded in 1997, and since then we've grown to over 270 employees and over $1.1 billion in revenue, most of that revenue coming from selling COTS products to the government. Um, we, are, we are based here in the DC metro area, close to systems integrators, distributors, resellers, and of course customers, which allows us to maintain that face-to-face interaction with, our, with the stakeholders in the industry that's so critical to doing uh, business in this market. We have access to over 30 contract vehicles at the federal, state, and local levels, which allows government to buy the way it wants to buy, um, and we are considered a federal small business. We do have audited financials and have been profitable since our inception, uh, and we do rely on ISO certified business processes, which allows us to operate more efficiently as a company. Now, I mentioned that Imix Group helps technology companies do business with the government. And the way we do that is through our unique platform of services. Uh, we focus on increasing our clients' revenue, supporting their demand creators, and helping them to operate more efficiently. And we call this approach to the business the government aggregation platform. And this platform of services is supported by five pillars that you see here that provide specialized resources that technology companies need to do business with the government. Now, this first pillar is market intelligence, which is, of course, what you'll be seeing here today. Uh, we have a specialized group of industry and government experts um, that identify targeted sales opportunities by analyzing government uh, budgets, legislation, technology drivers, and programs. The second pillar is marketing, which helps our clients to generate demand, uncover leads, and increase brand awareness among government end users. Um, our smart lead generation program is the third pillar, which helps our clients to set up meetings with qualified prospects. Of course, our channel development groups help ma helps manufacturers to build a more robust network of partners for a more productive channel. And finally, our turnkey business infrastructure group allows our clients to manage the complexity of doing business with the government. And this includes everything from order processing and price list management to contract management and legal support. Now this government aggregation platform is designed to help technology companies mitigate the risk of doing business with the government, accelerate their sales cycle, and ultimately grow their public sector, public sector business. Now, one last thing before handing it off to our speakers, we did want to cover a few upcoming cybersecurity related industry events. Um, these events will be listed in your territory planner that you'll receive via email after you submit your, um, your survey. Uh, beginning with FedScoop's Lowering the Cost of Government with IT Summit, that's coming up on August 22nd, it'll be here in DC. Um, the Tech America Vision Conference will be on October 16th and 17th, although they haven't listed a location as of yet, it will be somewhere in the DC metro area. Um, of course, act IX Executive Leadership Conference will be held in Colonial Williamsburg, as always, uh, on October 27th through the 29th. FCA's Mobile Technology Symposium will be November 22nd here in D.C. And finally, 1105 is hosting a Cybersecurity Government IT Forum here in D.C. on December 2nd and 3rd. Okay, so now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Um, they will be commenting back and forth from behind dueling podiums here. Um, to my left will be Lloyd McCoy. He's our senior DOD analyst with Imix Group's market intelligence team. Lloyd has two master's degrees, one in public policy and one in strategic intelligence. Lloyd spent eight years as an analyst with Defense uh, Intelligence Agency. He spent the last year here at Imix Group focusing on um, op strategic opportunity identification and perfecting the art of primary research. Um, from behind this lectern will be Stephanie Sullivan. She's our civilian consultant. Um, Stephanie has a master's degree in international politics and seven years of experience analyzing enterprise technology segments and market trends. Ladies and gentlemen, Lloyd McCoy and Stephanie Sullivan. Ooh, 
little bit of step there, okay. All right, thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. So as Tim mentioned, the purpose of our briefing today is to provide actionable intelligence for the IT product community on agencies, both civilian and defense, that are product focused and really worthy of your time. We'll start by providing statistics on the cyber landscape related to threats, and then we'll delve briefly into associated regulations, authorities, and key decision makers. Then Lloyd and I will go over a small sample of programs out there in the public space <clears throat> before yielding the floor to our distinguished panel. I would be remiss not to mention that if you recommend this event via social media, you are eligible to win a $100 gift card. It's also important to note the resources that we've leveraged while putting this briefing together. The market intelligence team used a number of resources, including the OMB budget documents, IT dashboard, as well as content from industry events, as well as calling directly into program offices to match up customer needs with <clears throat> client competencies. And when we start talking about funded programs, there are two types of money. First, you have SS or steady state, also referred to as OPEX, and that's your operations and maintenance funding. Then you have DME, also referred to as CAPEX, your development modernization and enhancement used for new IT purchases and solutions. The lines of the two categories have really begun to blur over the last few years, but for the time being, it's still really important to know the difference between the two. Supplementing this presentation is a planner containing additional programs and information across government that we won't have time to cover this morning. And you'll be receiving that in our post-event email later this afternoon. This document also includes points of contact for each program. And it's definitely a tool that's meant to take some of the guesswork out of building our pipeline in FY14. The federal government plans to spend about $13 billion on cybersecurity in FY14. And that's about a billion dollars more than what was spent in each of the last two years. And cybersecurity spending is likely to continue to grow, surpassing $14 billion by 2017. So obviously the need for cybersecurity isn't going anywhere, and determining what to defend against will play a large role in how much money the government must allocate towards cybersecurity. So those companies that are dealing with possible cuts to weapon systems, but that have data and network security competencies will benefit from increased cybersecurity spending. Still, $13 billion is a drop in the bucket compared to the estimated 140 to 300 billion in annual losses due to cyber breaches. And I'll just touch on a few of the highlights here from the President's FY14 cybersecurity budget, uh, namely $300 million in new funding for DHS to support continuous monitoring and intrusion prevention, new funding to help critical infrastructure owners and operators fortify their command and control systems, additional money to help agencies better connect the dots in identifying and responding to cyber incidents, and finally, $44 million in new funding for the fifth iteration of the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative, which is money dedicated to connecting cybersecurity centers and improve real-time analytics technology. There's been a striking increase in attacks and attempts to penetrate government networks, with incidents reported by federal agencies up about 800% since 2006. Here are some statistics of note that I found interesting, which I think you will too. And note that many of these attacks are sophisticated and required research and prep before targeting. And interestingly, among internal breaches, it was actually financial gain, which was the primary, most frequent motivation. What's even more sobering is that a majority of breaches take weeks or even months to be discovered. So remember, bad guys only have to be right once. Good guys have to be right all the time. As tech companies map out your strategies for 2014 and beyond, understanding the threat landscape is important. The nature and extent of the threat figures prominently in procurement decisions government customers make towards cybersecurity. Take cyber espionage, for example. Generally, it's because a country wants to advance their own military posture and perhaps weaken our military advantage in a future conflict. Well, guess what? It's happening all the time. And incidentally, 96% of cyber espionage originates from China. You might have also heard that they were able to access technologies re related to the JSF, the Joint Strike Fighter, 
and reportedly obtain data on our Black Hawk helicopters, ballistic missile systems, et cetera. And we're probably all aware of the mandate report in February, which identified a special unit of the Chinese military as the corporate for many of these attacks. The North Koreans almost exclusively focus their cyber intrusions on collecting uh, military technologies, as you can imagine. And while not state-sponsored, uh, we see cyber intrusions from Eastern Europe and Russia are usually criminal, often organized, and for financial gain. And you probably saw in the news last week uh, the four Russians and the Ukrainian that were indicted for stealing more than 160 million credit card numbers. There are other threat actors in the federal realm besides nation states. Uh, some of them are potentially state-sponsored act, state-sponsored groups, like for example the Free Syrian Army, who, while not nearly as sophisticated as the Chinese state-sponsored actors, are almost certainly looking for ways, in this case, to uncover U.S. plans regarding the Assad regime. We're also seeing the rise of hacktivists, with groups like Anonymous and WikiLeaks. As PRISM and before that WikiLeaks have shown, disclosures from inside actors, while they may incur infrequently, the quantity and quality of information that gets out can be very damaging. So there's a growing awareness among federal agencies that this is a problem that can't be eradicated. It can only be mitigated and deterred. And the larger component of this issue is that it's, it's about managing and knowing your people. The, it's a people problem as much as a technology problem. Focusing on federal incidents besides what we just discussed, um, there's been recent reports of attacks ag against uh, VA that were originated from China. Also, we've seen cases of vulnerabilities uh, in the Department of Energy's uh, National Nu Nuclear Security Agency due to security holes in a Department of Labor website that was frequently accessed by NNSA employees. And so we obviously haven't detected all the actions against federal computer systems, so any technologies that can reduce the number of unknowns are needed and welcome. As far as specific technologies targeted by cyber intrusions, uh, they largely parallel, no surprise, uh, to advances that countries like China are trying to develop for their economy and military. Uh, targeted attacks have become an established feature in the last two years, and it can often be highly sophisticated or as simple as tricking employees into disclosing information that can be used to gain access to sensitive data. With the huge volume of information shared online, we can expect the growth of cyber espionage to continue into the foreseeable future. Society's increasing reliance on the internet makes organizations of all kinds vulnerable to attacks, so the threat from hacktivism isn't going away. And we're all familiar with Stuxnet and Flame. Flame was highly sophisticated malware that was aimed at collecting information on Iran's nuclear program, whereas Stuxnet was an attack against uh, Iran's critical infrastructure and was able to shut down a number of their centrifuges in their nuclear facilities. Um, Stuxnet pioneered the use of highly sophisticated malware for targeted attacks on key production facilities. And looking ahead, we can expect more countries to develop cyber weapons designed to steal information or sabotage systems, not least because the entry level for developing such weapons <coughs> is much lower than is the case with real world military hardware. So it's possible that we may see copycat attacks by non-nation states with an increased risk of collateral damage beyond the intended victim of the attack. And that's partly because when sophisticated attacks like these occur, the cyber weapons used often become cyber or often become open source and can be exploited by anyone. The mobile malware threat is important given the increase in BYOD and mobility uh, within government. Um, there's been a 185% rise in mobile malware attacks over the last year, according to the latest GAO report. And so the key takeaway for you is that our federal government is going to have to protect itself against attacks like this. So they have to go, they're going to be on the lookout for investments and in products that will help them in defending against these threats. So now that we're aware of some of the threats within the cyber landscape, let's take a look at some of the policies and directives that the government is creating to help us deal with these challenges. <coughs> Okay, so now we're going to jump into cybersecurity authorities. And this is important because it can have effect on COTS acquisitions processes as agencies look to implement new controls, standards, and technical requirements in, into their acquisitions. 
First, we'll begin with business, uh, federal business system controls. On April 30th of this year, NIST released some pretty major revisions to Special Publication 800-53, which is now in its fourth revision. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this document, but just in case you aren't, think of it as a catalog of security standards <clears throat> that information systems have to meet in order to operate within the federal government. Basically, it's a baseline of security requirements. The publication provides more descriptive controls and bumps the total number of controls from around 600 to over 800. Most of the new controls added to the catalog focus on assurance and trustworthiness, and some real focus on, on integrating the assurance part of that into the development process. Next, we're going to touch on the evolution of cloud controls. Security concerns, as you can imagine, are one of the major barriers to entry for federal cloud computing. And FedRAMP is looking to standardize the process to make it both more reliable and scalable. FedRAMP is really designed as a do it once, use many types approach to federal cloud security. Basically, cloud service providers will be required to do one heavy lift up front to meet a common set of security standards to gain certification and accreditation. But once they get cleared, they're op authorized to operate within the government. Cloud service providers need to apply for a FedRAMP authority to operate, or ATO. They can do this either through the Joint Authorization Board, or JAB, made up of GSA, DHS, and DOD. Or they can apply for an ATO directly from an agency, like Amazon Web Services did with HHS. As of right now, there are six cloud service providers with ATOs. Four of them, Autonomic Resources, CGI Federal, HP, and Lockheed, got theirs from the JAB. The two others, Amazon Web Services and USDA, got theirs directly from an agency. Expect those numbers to go up soon. By 2014, all cloud service providers working in the government will be required to have an ATO. Now we'll move into legislation surrounding critical infrastructure. Beginning with Executive Order 13636, which I'll continue to reference in the next few upcoming slides. The EO was released on February 12, 2013, and directs the government to collaborate more closely with critical infrastructure owners and operators to strengthen information sharing surrounding cyber threats. And legislation will be used to help reinforce cybersecurity standards and best practices. The order calls for NIST to develop a framework to gather intelligence on cyber attacks and cyber threats, as well as address network security gaps in critical components of US infrastructure which could include banking, utility, and transportation networks. To date, a series of three workshops have been conducted to gather feedback from industry and stakeholders to really identify priority elements the framework must address. NIST expects a publi to publish the draft preliminary cybersecurity framework this August <clears throat> with additional revisions expected to be made following the fourth workshop that will be held in September. A final version of the framework is expected to be released in February of 2014. With that said, participating in stakeholder engagements and familiarizing yourself with the draft guidelines will really be critical to all COTS vendors. In order to understand how your products and solutions can enhance the framework and meet these voluntary but very critical security needs, after all, the end goal of these working groups will be to eventually bake cybersecurity standards into federal acquisitions in order to ensure cyber protection. The Presidential Policy Directive 21, or PPD 21, was issued as a complement to the Cybersecurity Executive Order. PPD 21 develops a situational awareness capability that addresses both the physical and cyber aspects of how infrastructure is functioning in a near real time, and encourages the federal government to st strengthen the security and the resiliency of its own critical infrastructure, which is outlined in the Directive's three strategic goals. PPD 21 also defines sector-specific agencies, or SSAs, for critical infrastructure segments and mandates information sharing and cooperation between SSAs, state and local organizations, as well as international partners. Next, we're going to discuss the future of the National Defense Authorization Act. Both last year's NDAA and the proposed NDAA for 2014 has some far-reaching implications for cybersecurity. 2014's NDAA, if passed, would allow DOD more visibility into industry's proprietary information 
if there's been an attack on their networks or vulnerabilities in their supply chain by enhancing reporting requirements and vulnerability management tools. Right now, there are no laws requiring industry to share this information, but the 2014 NDAA may open the door to future action by DOD or Congress, meaning the government may soon require companies to provide access to their infected source code. Now we're going to transi transition to the key thought leaders and decision makers when it comes to cybersecurity in the federal arena. The executive order I, I referenced a minute ago offers DHS a prominent role in defending both federal and critical systems, such as the electric grid and the .gov domains, and requires the agency to produce unclassified reports of cyber threats that identify a specific target, as well as establish a process to disseminate those reports. DHS was ex uh, required to expand the Enhanced Cybersecurity Services Program to all critical infrastructure sectors within 120 days of the order, so this should have already happened, and is also responsible for creating a voluntary program to support the adoption of the cybersecurity framework by coming up with incentives to promote participation in the program. The agency is also working with SSAs to identify critical infrastructure where a cybersecurity incident could reason reasonably result in a catastrophic regional or national effects on public health or safety, economic security, or national security. They're responsible for updating that list every year and reporting it to the president. Lastly, it's important to note that the National Protection and Programs Directorate, or MPPD, is the cyber component out of DHS that leads the national effort to protect and enhance the resiliency of the nation's physical and cyber infrastructure, which we'll talk about here on the next few slides. Okay, so here's a snapshot of how MPPD is broken out into four major offices. You have the Federal Protective Service, or FPS, led by Director Eric Patterson, providing a number of integrated security and law enforcement services. You have the Office of Infrastructure Protection, or IP, led by Assistant Secretary Caitlin Durkovich, which has the role of reducing risk to our critical infrastructure posed by acts of terrorism. You also have MPPD's Biometric Identity Management Office, led by Acting Director Shawnee Lyon. And this may be new on the scene for some of you, but others you might recognize it as US Visit. There's been a lot of back and forth as to the future of this office. The Obama administration originally proposed to bury U, uh, US Visit in its 2013 budget request by placing the core of the program within the Bureau of Customs and Border Protection, with really little to no guidance here. But Congress fought back to save the office and allow for the continued elimination of fraud and visa passport and visa fraud at our borders by using innovative biometric solutions like digital fingerprints and photographs. And this is to make sure that folks, when presenting travel documents, are really who they say they are. The final office to note is the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications, or CSNC, which has the mission to ensure the security, resiliency, and reliability of the nation's cyber and communication infrastructure. MPPD and CSNC have in particular seen a fair share of turnover at the senior leadership level. Phyllis Schneck, Vice President and CTO for the Public Sector at McAfee, is said to be a likely choice for the Deputy Undersecretary position for cybersecurity, where Bruce McConnell has been serving in the acting role, and Bruce will be leaving in August to go back to the private sector. sector. And Bobby Stemfley is serving as CSNC's Acting Assistant Secretary for her second go around in this position. Offices to note within CSNC include Network Security Deployment, led by Brendan Good. This office leads the development and implementation of cybersecurity technologies to continuously counter emerging cyber threats. You have <clears throat> the Federal Network Resilience Office, led by John Stroyfurt, collaborating across the federal government to enhance the nation's cybersecurity posture by providing cyber diagnostics and mitigation services. One additional office to note is the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, or NCIC, which is responsible for sharing cyber and communication threat information at the national level and coordinating response activities for the .com and .gov domains. Larry Zelvin, who heads up the NCIC, said at a recent event, he has growing concern for advanced persistent threat, which is becoming stronger, larger, and more sophisticated every day through the use of destructive means to disrupt operations. He placed a major emphasis on the need to educate both employees and society to under, understand risk before solutions can ever really begin to take place. Now, in the interest of time, this is a very high-level overview of the major cybersecurity players within the Defense Department. We'll go into more detail in the Territory Planner. 
Um, NSA helps the government understand uh, what threats exist out there in cyberspace, be it from foreign adversaries or through poorly designed hardware and software through its information assurance mission. The director of NSA actually wears two hats, serving also as the commander of Cybercom. Uh, Cybercom centralizes command of DOD cyberspace operations and orchestrates the defense of US military networks. And they also have an office of capability that's being built up. General Keith Alexander, the director of NSA and, Cyber, and the Cybercom commander, retires this winter, and it's entirely possible his position will be divested with Cybercom getting its own commander. And we all know for a couple of years they've been talking about making Cybercom a unified command, and no doubt that it's becoming an ever more important player um, in this space, but we haven't had any real progress towards that as far as we know. Uh, DISA is also a key player. Um, you'll see me, uh, many of DOD CIO Terry Takai's initiatives run out of this agency, uh, such as the Joint Information Environment and the Department's Enterprise Email and Mobility Efforts. The Defense Cyber Crime Center, uh, DC3, is a DOD agency providing computer forensic support to the various defense criminal investigative organizations, and it's heavily involved in researching and developing digital forensics tools and techniques for the government. Now we're going to switch gears and spend some time on civilian cybersecurity spending and investments. Here's a quick snapshot of DHS's FY14 $6.1 billion request. Those of you who have covered DHS for a while know at the end of the fiscal year offers a lot of procurement opportunity and quicker acquisitions. But due to delays and obligated spend due to the sequester and the CR, as well as larger, larger utilization of IDIQs and GWACs, Expect to see as much as 40% in procurement spend between now and the end of September. Last year, $14 billion of DHS's budget went through DHS acquisitions, while another $3 billion went through interagency agreements like ELAs, BPAs, GWACs, and MACs. DHS anticipates 20% of procurement spend will be strategically sourced through partnerships with service providers. And in FY13, DHS anticipates saving more than $264 million through strategic sourcing agreements. You can see that CBP is the component with the largest dedicated IT spend and is among the components with the largest request for DME, which also includes MPPD and USCIS. In terms of DHS's primary business reference model, or BRM, spend is heavily allocated to IT infrastructure maintenance, border and transportation security, surveillance, intelligence and reconnaissance, as well as threat and vulnerability management. And now here's a quick breakdown of the anticipated FY14 cybersecurity spend within MPPD. You can see here that the component has slotted $387 million for cybersecurity spending according to the FY14 budget request, with the bulk of that money going towards intrusion prevention and continuous monitoring. I just want to touch on a noticeable drop in the cybersecurity spending for FY14 when compared with FY13 cybersecurity funding levels within MPPD which accounts for $756.8 million through the end of this year. The drop in part could be the result of an uh, award anticipated for the CMAS contract in support of the CDM program, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. DHS, like many agencies, has struggled with hiring skilled professionals while budgets continue to be slashed. And retaining skilled professionals in the public arena has also been very difficult. Education and training continue to be on the forefront of staff needs, but are unfortunately some of the first things to be cut in a sequester. Training may not serve as the most viable option for software vendors, but in terms of other COTS needs for the agency, Mark Powell, Deputy Assistant Commandant for C4IT and the Deputy CIO for the U.S. Coast Guard, identified configuration management as a major challenge and said it needs to be standardized to ensure all systems attached to the network share the same common configurations and can identify devices out of the network. So network mapping and scanning will be critical here. DHS as a whole continues to place emphasis on automating and authenticating applications, as well as placing a continued focus on their workplace as a service cloud offering. They aims to provide virtual desktop and mobile device management capabilities. DHS's car wash is still in the proof of concept phase for an enterprise-wide mobile device management application process, which will allow the agency to follow applications through their life cycle, including testing, vetting, and validating data. 
The car wash methodology allows for data to, and code to be cleansed and become more secure and trusted for exchange with other agencies or with citizens. Larry Zelvin, the NCIC director, identified one of the agency's biggest cybersecurity challenges as information sharing and getting the information they need to protect the networks. Right now, there's no statutory mandate to share information with the government, so companies and their lawyers do not have to allow the government to review private, private industry data. And this can only happen if clear legislation has passed, which has yet to happen. Zelvin also said it takes time to build relationships with private industry in order to be comfortable with sharing that kind of information. And federal agencies really don't have that kind of time. I recently spoke with Jeff Eisensmith, the CISO for DHS at a recent event, about what security solutions he's most in need of for FY14. He mentioned products and solutions for a cyber, cyber kill chain, which he re-emphasized at another event last week. According to Eisensmith, the concept of the intrusion kill chain involves five to seven links, and every link has to be broken in an, in an intrusion. But the secret of the kill chain is if any one of those links should hold, the attack won't succeed. And the government will be able to gain intelligence using the kill chain links to improve network security. Each time the kill chain succeeds, it costs the intruder more and more for an attack, and it becomes easier to measure how many links are broken. The kill chain is how DHS will begin to measure continuous monitoring in the future. In the case of an intrusion, it becomes critical to understand your network. Can it survive an attack? How do you limit the damage? And not really bring down the network. Now we'll move to funded DHS opportunities, beginning with the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation, or CDM, program, which has requested $168 million in FY14, of which $121 million would go towards DME, or that new IT procurement money. CDM provided tested continuous monitoring, diagnostics, and mitigation activities designed to strengthen the security posture of the federal .gov and networks. So this includes 17 of the largest federal agencies and DHS itself. DHS will centrally oversee the procurement, operations, and maintenance of diagnostic sensors deployed to each agency. Using input from sensors and agency-level dashboards, officials at the agencies will be able to quickly identify what problems to fix first and empower technical managers to prioritize and mitigate risks. DHS expects the tools will eventually conduct 60 to 80 billion security checks at least every three days across government. And the data will be reported through DHS's CyberScope system. DHS will also maintain a dashboard to provide situational awareness on a federal level. For those agencies that require additional support, contractors will be pre-vetted by agencies to provide continuous monitoring as a service or CMAS to support data integration and agency customization services. The CMAS contract has a uh, ceiling value of $6 billion and is currently in the source selection phase with an award that could be made any day now. Rumor has it maybe next week. However, there are some speculation as to why there is a delay. An industry source who's following the contract has said the delay is because agencies are reluctant to sign a mem memorandum of understanding with DHS to use the contract. But on the flip side, John Stroyfort says that DHS is really impressed with the buy-in he's getting from agencies regarding the CDM effort. Stroyfort, in tandem with Danny Toller, his deputy, head up the CDM effort. Stroyfort has said over the next few years, we'll see that federal government focusing on security controls for the network, packaged software, and eventually customized software. Civilian agencies are discussing trying to cover critical controls in three phases over the next three years for networks and COT software. Amex Group has teamed our GSA schedules with many of the SIs bidding CDM and CMAS. We're supporting them with a catalog covering a broad range of relevant cybersecurity products. We expect to be on multiple awarded BPAs and we'll work with awarded primes to add more in-scope products to their BPA catalogs. Amex Group clients can contact us to express interest and we'll be reaching out when we have more details on that award. The National Cybersecurity and Protection System, or NCPS, operationally known as Einstein, requested $406 million in FY14, of which $72 million would be used towards the procurement of new IT solutions and products. NCPS is an integrated system of intrusion, detection, analytics, intrusion prevention, and information sharing capabilities. Using to defend the civilian government's IT infrastructure from cyber threats, so where CDM focuses more, uh, more on internal threats, NCPS is focused more on external threats to the DACA domains. 
Einstein 3 is the latest block released to protect agency computer systems from cyber attacks, specifically being able to detect malicious traffic and proactively stop attacks before they can affect vital systems. Bobby Semple mentioned at last week's Merrick Talk event that the first agency, which she would not identify, went live at 7 p.m. on July 24th with the first packet of Einstein 3, which will be used to gather perimeter information. Next to move to Einstein 3 will be the VA, and DHS is con uh, currently working on installing Einstein 3 on its own systems, but must first negotiate with its ISP. Brendan Good is the program manager for NCPS, and FY14 plans include the development of addition an additional set of cyber mission information sharing applications, the deployment of a second set of prevention countermeasures to a portion of the .gov domain, along with the maintenance of an initial set of applications that provide operators with automated means to share and collaborate on cyber threat information. Now we'll move into the Department of Justice. DOJ is an interesting case because its priorities are a little bit different when it comes to cybersecurity. While justice obviously has the same priorities as other agencies in terms of protecting the safety and integrity of its networks, the department also has the responsibility to investigate and prosecute intrusions into federal networks. The overall IT budget request for the agency is $2.7 billion in FY14, with the lion's share of that work going towards the FBI. IT infrastructure, criminal investigation and surveillance, and computer and network integration are the primary BRM services for FY14. DOJ has requested $668 million for cybersecurity and operations in FY14. And that will include systems with, that will help mitigate domestic cyber threats and prosecute cyber criminals. The bulk of the $668 million is going towards the FBI, but funding also goes towards the Justice Management Division, which is the home of the Justice Security Operations Center, or JSOC, and is also handling some of the enterprise-wide security purchases for the department. The National Security and Criminal Divisions handle the bulk of DOJ cyber operations that are not conducted by the FBI, including the prosecution of cyber criminals. Now moving into our last civilian opportunity is the FBI's Next Generation Cyber Initiative. This is a little bit different from some of the prior programs that you've seen because it's not a line item on the Exhibit 53s. However, it does represent a significant portion of DOJ's overall cybersecurity spending of $668 million. You have $86 million focused on adding more special agents and computer scientists to help investigate cyber crimes, add new workstations so that field agents have more of an enhanced access to knowledge that they need during the course of investigations. So there's a lot of opportunity here to supply workstations and to enhance analytical capabilities of investigative or case management software. And now we'll move into the defense, cybersecurity spending, and investments. So out of the $40 billion DOD IT budget, about $4.7 billion is dedicated to cybersecurity for the next fiscal year, and that's an 18% increase over uh, FY13 requested levels. And much of this increase is to uh, fund expansions within Cybercom, enlarging and consolidating the DOD cyber workforce, interagency cybersecurity centers, increased network defense operations, as well as added funding for intrusion prevention and detection. So despite declining budgets and workforce cuts, there is bipartisan support for more cybersecurity spending, which is good news, obviously, for the technology company or industry. This is a three-year uh, picture of the DOD budget uh, broken out by uh, buckets of money that OSD recognizes as cybersecurity. In fact, we've seen indications uh, that the cybersecurity budget is higher, yet it's reportedly four to five billion. And the reason why is that a lot of cybersecurity money is spread among traditional technology users that might not be designated as cybersecurity per se, but they do cybersecurity work. So recognize that cyber means different things to different people. So when you hear them mention cyber budgets, you need to ask them, what do you mean by that? So you, you can get to where the opportunity really is. The Pentagon plans to request about $23 billion on cybersecurity through 2018, with about $9.3 billion over the same period dedicated to systems aimed at blocking hackers and preventing disruptions on Pentagon computers. Another $9 billion is allocated for both defensive and offensive capabilities. 
Furthermore, Cybercom headquarters is projected to receive as much as $1.3 billion through 2018. Before we delve into specific programs and initiatives, let's examine how the department views the cyber realm since cybersecurity takes place in cyberspace. For one, DOD now recognizes that cyberspace is as, is as important a military domain as land, sea, air, and space. And the military com and policy community continue to work through what this means as far as command and control, how it wages war, what constitutes red lines, etc. Also, as we become more connected online and our critical infrastructure relies on cyberspace, defending this realm extends beyond the, the defense establishment. And so, because the cyber domain lacks boundaries, the Pentagon is working with its interagency and international partners to mitigate risk and improve cybersecurity. In my discussions um, with DOD officials, um, more often than not, a trained workforce is mentioned first in the list of their priorities. Uh, training and education are, are so important because threats from inside, as I mentioned before, even unintentional mishandling of computer equipment and data can be just as damaging as remote attacks. And we get, go into a little more detail into how DOD is addressing the insider threat in the planner. I'll now cover briefly a small sample of DOD initiatives. Um, the department is implementing a new cyber force planning model with the aim of improving what has been a disjointed approach to cybersecurity. And incidentally, the J6 of Cybercom is part of a, a small group that leads the development of the JIE. And one of the major components of the JIE is a single security architecture to increase security and realize efficiencies. Uh, the single security architecture is designed to allow DOD cyber operators at every level to see the status of their networks for operations and security and enable commonality in how cyber threats are countered. So the US wants the ability to know who is operating on, an, on its networks, what they're doing, and be able to attribute their actions with a high degree of confidence. And the single security architecture describes how core the core date DOD data centers and the server computing resources they contain must be structured, what cyber defenses are required on those computers, and what detection and diagnosis the data center must have. Now remember, JIE isn't a, isn't a funded program. But if you're going into a conversation with Cybercom or Army or DISA, you will need to know what JIE is. In the 2012 NDAA, Congress mandated that DOD detect and prevent counterfeit electronic parts from entering the DOD supply chain. The law creates significant liability for any entity at any tier in the supply chain. And one of the business processes that can lessen potential liability is if the buyer can show that the item came directly from the original equipment manufacturer or OEM authorized distributors or resellers. And so the MX Group Trusted Supplier Program guarantees that products sourced through us either come directly from OEMs or via OEM authorized distributors or resellers. The Defense Industrial uh, cybersecurity program is a voluntary initiative um, to enhance and supplement industry participants' cap capabilities to safeguard defense information that resides on or, or transits industry's information systems. Command officials want to know when their information has been exposed so the commander can identify the risks to their operations. In return, the military organization shares information with commercial partners so they can enhance their security. So even without the NDAA requiring industry right now to share information, industry, at least within this consortium, is doing it anyway. Now, programs dedicated specifically to cybersecurity are difficult to find, but targeting newer programs with ample funding is a good place to start. Also, initiatives such as commercial cloud adoption and data center consolidation are also areas where you can find funding for information assurance requirements. Win T, run out of the Army PEO C3 uh, provides voice, video, and data communications uh, to the soldier from the battlefront to the rear. It is the Army's highest funded program in FY14 by DME, with the service requesting $1.3 billion for all three increments of the program. And that's a 46% increase over prior year levels. 
the majority of the increase supports uh, new investments in increment one and two. Uh, specifically, the Army hopes to leverage COTS to improve network monitoring for increment two enhancements, which allow staff to maintain connectivity to the network while maneuvering around the battlefield. The cybersecurity requirements call for technologies that will detect network attacks, provide immediate protection, and alert users and information assurance managers. And these type of programs that support tactical communications and special ops, that's where the Army is headed. So when you also consider the fact that recent attempts to transfer $128 million out of the program failed because of the, con the program's congressional support, plus the fact that WinT was one of those programs hacked by the Chinese government, I think it's pretty safe to say that not only is WinT not going anywhere, but it's going to be rich in cybersecurity needs for the foreseeable future. Increment 2 anticipates a follow-on to the initial production contract that was, that was awarded in 2010, and is awarded, an award is anticipated for Q4 of FY14. The cybersecurity requirements will include authentication servers, internet protocol encryptors, and user authentication tools, just to name a few. And before we go to the next slide, I think it's really cool that our, our partners and clients are uh, helping warfighters stay connected to the network, increase their situational awareness, and find out find where the bad guys are. DISA is leading the DOD uh, effort to create an enterprise solution to uh, support mobility requirements by using commercial carrier networks uh, capable of handling sensitive or even classified data. And I chose this program in part because it is the first defense mobility related line item um, in Exhibit 53, and likely not the last. Uh, DISA has taken a phased approach to implementing the program, and it will provide the Pentagon's 3 million plus employees with a wide range of mobile devices and enable, the, able, enable them to use those devices regardless of location to share classified and protected data. The proliferation of mobile devices is a it's been a catalyst for DISA working more closely with commercial providers on developing cybersecurity standards. By working with the manufacturers sooner, uh, the agency benefits from having them integrate security into their testing approach as they develop the system. And this partnership is critical given the dynamic nature and fast turnaround of the mobile device market. And what government folks are telling me is that while they are filling the pool of mobility in BYOD, there is a tug of war between the user experience and security demands, and finding that balance is the rub. Still, the future will very likely see a lot of mission-specific applications for the mobile environment, and this evolution will need a good mobile device manager, uh, mobile devices, and embedded mobile applications. And so, this is charged with establishing a DOD Mobility Program Management Office by next year to provide guidelines uh, for secure classified and unclassified mobile communications capabilities. Digital Management won the device man manager contract to develop the policy secur security and permissions that define the functions the user is allowed to conduct on the mobile device. For now, there will be separate device management systems in the classified and unclassified realms. In addition to changing the military's, the military's capabilities, DOD mobility will also increase the security of commercial devices being sold to the public. If industry can say, hey, we meet the security requirements mandated by DOD, and we're, sell we're selling mobility products in the defense agencies, then that potentially opens a lot of doors, be it banking, medical health records, et cetera. The last program I'd like to cover is D6. Uh, this program is meant to give battlefield commanders an all-seeing eye of information. Just think of the eye of Sauron, Lord of the Rings. Uh, this program enables commanders to task battle space uh, sensors and receive intelligence information from multiple sources so that analysts can do their work with the situational awareness that they need. Some of the cybersecurity uh, requirements for the next two fiscal years will center around D6 fixed sites and supported data centers, as well as capabilities that will enable soldiers to access authorized intelligence information from their computer or mobile device as needed. And on a personal note, during my deployments to the Middle East uh, for DIA, I used D6 on a regular basis, and it was a valuable tool. Now, as we conclude, 
it's important to keep in mind that despite the combination of CRs, sequestration, and budget cuts, the cybersecurity spend is expected to continue to grow across the federal government. And in fact, cybersecurity is one of the few areas where President Obama and Congress can actually agree on increasing spending. And as we noted at the beginning of the presentation, some analysts estimate that cybersecurity spending will surpass $14 billion by 2017. And don't forget that agencies recognize that you are the experts in the field. They're virtually begging for stakeholder engagement. So it's really becoming more and more important to involve yourself in building out requirements and to meet those voluntary but critical security needs. Keeping an eye out for and attending those working groups will provide you with input on how to eventually get your cybersecurity solutions and standards baked into federal acquisitions. As we mentioned, please take a minute to fill out our, your survey because your feedback is very important to us. And filling out the survey will give you access to the territory planner in the post-event email. Our market intelligence team put together this comprehensive territory planner that will arm you with actionable intelligence to help you build your pipeline in the coming year. And we encourage you all to reference it regularly. And by the way, it includes additional programs and contact information across the civilian and DOD agencies. Amex Group looks forward to working with you towards a productive end to FY13 and towards a successful FY14. Thanks for coming.